students are having lunch for you here, right? <laughs> I think they're picking it up somewhere, so I think it will, it will be. Some sounds. We can't see you, but we can hear you. We're on. Oh, okay. Just okay. show. Yeah. It's just that how I know that we're broadcasting. <laughs> All right. Welcome to. Uh, Friday Transportation Seminar. I'm Kelly Clifton, a professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering. And I'm very pleased to introduce today Ralph Bueller, who is an assistant professor at Virginia Tech, uh, the Alexandria campus. And he is one of a few esteemed professors that look at bicycling uh, around the world, and he does a lot of comparative analysis. So uh, we're going to have a very interesting talk today where he's comparing cycling here with other places in the world. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I understand some of you have to be here, but nonetheless, I'll try to make it worth your time. Um, the talk today is uh, titled, Making Urban Transport Sustainable, Comparison of Germany and the U.S. And I will start out by comparing daily travel behavior, which is how we get around in our cities for daily trips. So mainly looking at the car, walking, cycling, and public transportation. After that, I will look at the sustainability of transport systems in a comparative uh, uh, way across the countries, and then I investigate some of the differences that we'll see and look at factors that we know from the literature that influence travel behavior. And then the main part of the talk will be about uh, policies that make urban transport more sustainable. And to highlight some of the policies implemented in Germany over the last 40 years, I bring a case study of the German city of Freiburg, which is sort of Germany's sustainability capital. And this is actually a photo taken in Freiburg on their, in their pedestrianized uh, downtown area, and you see sort of the sustainable modes of transport here. You have walking, uh, public transport, and bicycles. In Western countries, since the Second World War, we have uh, fast increasing motorization. This graph shows you cars, light trucks, and SUVs per thousand population. All the way on the top, you have the United States, followed sort of by Germany, Canada, Australia, and at the bottom, then you have the UK, the Netherlands, and uh, Denmark. Americans still own about 40%, 45% more cars per capita than the next group uh, of countries. Americans also drive their cars for a higher share of trip than people in other countries. This shows you the percentage of trips uh, by bicycle, walking, and public transport in the various countries. See the United States over here, about 15% of all trips are made by these alternatives to the car. The rest is automobile. And then you see the other European countries with Germany circled over there, which much higher, with much higher shares um, for these, uh, for walking, cycling, and public transportation. Americans do not only drive for a higher share of trip, they also drive for longer distances. Um, Americans drive about 24,000 kilometers in the car a year, compared to only 12,000, so only half in Germany. Driving for a higher share of trips and longer distances has sustainability implications for transportation. For example, in here, if we look at the share of trips on foot by bicycle and public transport on this axis and the tra ground passenger transport related CO2 emissions per person per year, we see a clear correlation between a higher share of trip by alternative means of transport and lower CO2 emissions. In fact, the U.S. has about three times the CO2 emissions per capita from ground passenger transport than most of these uh, European countries there. There are, of course, other dimensions of sustainability, not just CO2 emissions, energy use, also about three times more energy use for ground passenger transport in the U.S. Traffic fatalities are higher on a per capita basis. There are twice as many traffic fatalities in the U.S. than in Germany 
on a per kilometer traveled basis, they are still higher, and especially for walking and uh, cycling. Uh, if we look at the economic aspect, U.S. households spend more on transport than households in Germany. About 17% of the disposable income of a household goes towards transport in the U.S., compared to 14% in Germany, mainly related to owning that second or third car. That comes out to be around $2,500 a year that's spent more on transport here. For governments, uh, the U.S. governments, all levels of governments also spend more on roadways and public transport per inhabitant than uh, governments in Germany, about $600 per year per person versus 450 If we look at the last dimension of sustainability, look at public health, we have much higher obesity rate, twice as high in the U.S. than in Germany. It's not solely related, but partially related to less physical activity that you can get through uh, daily travel. Some of you may already be wondering, well, why compare the two countries? There are so many differences, and there are many differences, but there are many interesting comparisons that make lessons uh, meaningful, at least I think that. They, both countries have federal systems of government with a long history of local self-government. They have strong economies, high standards of living, important automobile industries, and in fact, in Germany, the car industry is twice as important for the national economy than the U.S. car industry, and I put a couple of car manufacturer logos uh, up there for uh, German and U.S. manufacturers. Um, they have two of the highest levels of car ownership in the world. We already saw that. Most adults in both countries have driver's licenses and access to a car and could use it if they chose to. They have extensive road networks, especially limited access highways. In Germany, the Autobahn network still has many, many stretches that do not have uh, speed limits on it. So you can go as fast uh, as you like. And by the way, down here, what you see here, that's the battle cry of uh, German AAA, and it translates to free car travel for free citizens. Um, Lastly, in both countries, urban and suburban development in Germany, a lot of it was redevelopment after the Second World War, happened while there was uh, strongly increasing motorization and cities could be adapted to cars. From the literature, we know that there are certain factors that influence travel behavior and how we get around. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to investigate how these factors play out within each country and across country. For example, we know that as your income increases, people tend to make a higher share of trips by car. And here you have the poorest 25% in each country on the right-hand side, the wealthiest 25% on the left-hand side. And as income increases, the sh percentage of trips made by car increases in both countries. However, if we look across countries, even the wealthiest 25% in Germany drive for a lower share of trips than the poorest 25% of Americans. Similarly, we know that the more cars a household owns, the more people in the household drive by automobile. This again goes from low car ownership here to high car ownership there. In both countries, increasing car ownership is related to more kilometers of car travel uh, per day. However, in Germany, those that have one and a half cars per driver, that's more cars than there are people who could drive them, drive about the same distance per day than Americans that only have a half a car uh, per driver in a, in a household. We know also from the literature that density, population density, helps explain car travel distance. Again, we have increasing density going from the right to the left here, and we see that even controlling for density, the daily car travel distance in the U.S. is higher. It's even to the extent that Germans in the lowest density category over here drive for about the same kilometers per day than Americans in the highest density categories. Again, within both countries, our theories hold true, but across countries, they do not... Um, fully work. This is a comparison from a study we just did looking at Washington, D.C. and uh, Stuttgart in Germany. And the color shows you the percentage of trips made by automobile. The darker the color is, the higher the share of trips uh, by car. And you will notice that the center of Stuttgart and Washington, D.C. have about the same car mode share. But as soon as you leave Washington, D.C., you get very, in very high car-dependent areas. In fact, some of these blue colors here are not found even in the most remote areas in the Stuttgart uh, region. Some of you may think, well, it may be trip distance. The U.S. is almost a continent. Germany is only a country in Europe. It's not entirely true. About 30% of trips in both countries, 28% in the U.S., 32% in Germany, are shorter than a mile. However, even for these short trips, mode choice varies significantly. In the U.S., trips shorter than a mile, about 70% are made by automobile. 
compared to about 30% in Germany. I put the bicycle next to it, 15% of the short trips in Germany are made by bike, only 2% in the US. And as trip distance increases in both countries, you get uh, uh, more uh, daily car travel. Uh, a last interesting facet I want to introduce here is, this is probably food, food for thought or for discussion, is we see diverging trends for different age groups in car use in Germany. This graph shows you daily car travel distance in kilometers by age group, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, all the way to 70 plus over there. That's for 1976. The age group 20 to 29, 30 to 39 have the highest car travel distance. By the mid-1990s, all age groups had increased their driving, and again, the 20 to 29-year-olds up there have the highest kilometers of car use per day. However, by 2007, the group of the 20 to 29-year-olds that was sort of leading the charge in driving now resembles more the 20 to 29-year-olds in 1976 than in the mid-1990s. We see that, that trend in different data sets, and even if you slice the age groups here differently. What I want to allege in the rest of this talk is that transport policies help to explain changes over time, and they also help to explain the remaining difference between the two countries that never really went away when we looked at income, car ownership, density, etc. In both countries, there is the federal framework for transport policies, and in Germany, that is more favorable for other modes than the car. For example, taxes and regulation on car use are more expensive. There has traditionally been more funding for walking and cycling and public transport from the federal level. However, the U.S. is catching up, especially since 1991 and the transport uh, legislation there. Land use planning in Germany requires cooperation. So there's no federal land use planning, but they require municipalities to coordinate their uh, land use plans. They provide sort of strategic leadership with a national transport plan, and there's a national land use strategy, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not a real plan. However, the specific policies that make or made transportation more sustainable occur and were developed on the local level. And in fact, the local level was pushing the federal level to become more sustainable over the last 40 years. To show you how these policies work, I bring a case study from, as I said before, the German city of Freiburg, a relatively small town, 220,000 inhabitants, um, quite a sizable share of students. It's the center of the Black Forest regions, about 700,000 inhabitants. It's in the southwest of Germany, close to Switzerland and France, and it is, as most European cities seem to claim, in the center of Europe. Most European cities have a map that shows them in the center of Europe. I don't know how they do that, but so they, they also claim to be in the, in the center there. The the economy and population in Germany have grown faster than the, uh, in Freiburg have grown faster than the German average. The city has had strong environmental policies since the 70s, so not just in transportation, but also in energy, air quality, and other uh, uh, areas. It's called Germany's environmental capital. And there's an important eco uh, industry, a lot of it related to solar and wind. And it was the first larger German city with the Green Party uh, mayor. Now, some trends in transportation in Freiburg. This shows you the motorization, the ownership of cars and light trucks per thousand in Freiburg, Germany, and the U.S. And what you notice here is that after the Second World War, Freiburg had higher car ownership than the German average. That was still true in 1970. By the 1990s, Germany overall had a higher level of car ownership than Freiburg, and since then, car ownership in Freiburg has not increased. It has been flat. And you see Germany increasing, and then if the United States as a reference um, over there. Similarly, if we look at the available data of the percentage of trips made by different modes of transport, we notice since the 1980s a decline in the share of car trips from 38 to 32 percent of all trips, and increases here in public transport from 11 to 18, and bicycling from 15 to 27. We also notice a decline in walking, especially in the 1980s, since the late 1980s had sort of been, um, been stabilized. More short-term trends are available for other indicators. For example, since 1990, uh, car use measured as kilometers of car travel declined in the city by 7% on local roads by 13%. 
CO2 emissions per capita are down 13% for the, from transportation for the same time frame. Bicycling has gotten more and more, uh, more safer. Uh, fatalities per million kilometers cycled are lower in Freiburg than in Germany overall and much lower than in the United States. And the public transport system has become increasingly uh, efficient. Only 10% of the operating budget are subsidies compared to 25% subsidies in German average and 65% subsidies in the US average. This positions Freiburg, there it is, alongside other cities in the percentage of trips made by public transport, cycling and walking. You see Freiburg is similar to cities like Bern, Basel, Münster, Karlsruhe. And then over here, I put in uh, uh, commute data for the US, Arlington County, one of the big transit commuter uh, uh, cities, which has about the size of, of Freiburg. This is the US average, so much higher use of these modes than in comparable municipalities. Freiburg hasn't always been that way. This is, and I'll show that in an iteration of a couple of, 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 of photos now. In the 1950s, that's the Vivili Bridge in Freiburg, and you see trolleys running across the bridge. By the 1960s, they had torn out these trolley tracks because the trolley was the mud of the past and nobody wanted trolleys anymore. Today, this is a bicycle bridge. Cars are banned from the bridge and only bicycles can use it. Pedestrians can walk on either side. Freiburg is not alone. Other cities, and that's for example the city of Lörrach, 50,000 inhabitants only, quite small, have made a similar transition. In 1953, that's their main downtown area and there's, there's a fountain there you have to Remember that. They have a trolley running there. They have bicycles. They have an automobile. By 1970, there's the fountain. Due to urban renewal, this intersection is completely redone. The old building is gone, and more modern building is there. And you notice how the cars are sort of pushing pedestrians and bicycles to the side. This, I found that in the city archives, this is a postcard. The city thought this is so great what we achieved, put it on a postcard and send it to everyone. Due to a policy reversal, today, there's the fountain. This is a pedestrianized area where uh, bicycles and pedestrians share the space and cars have to park on the outside. I will now go through four categories of policies that are related to these changes. The first category is uh, policies that restrict car use. Uh, the first policy here is a policy that happens on the national or on the state level. That's the, pri that's the taxation of uh, gasoline we see from 1990 to 2010, the cost of gasoline has been much higher in Germany than in the, in the United States. The two curves are uh, diverging uh, a little more strongly in the late 1990s, early 2000s because of a environmental tax reform that was implemented in Germany. Over five years, they increased the gas tax by about 15 cents per gallon every January 1st to a total of 75 cents per gallon. And at the same time, they lowered Social Security taxes. So you had more in your paycheck, but you paid more at the pump. The whole project was countrywide, uh, almost revenue neutral. 95% of the money got distributed back into the, uh, the tax reduction. 5% were used to administer the program and to do uh, research on it. You can see the use of the gas tax and subsidies for roadways when you look at this graph. It's a little bit complicated, but it compares, for all levels of government, the revenues collected from roadway users, that's your gas tax, tolls, registration fees, personal property taxes on cars, etc., compared to the expenditures on roadways for all levels of government. If we are at this blue line at one, we have about as much revenue collected from road users as is spent on roadways. If we are below, we have net subsidies to roadways, from your property taxes, from your from sales taxes, from, from other taxes. In both countries, in 1975, we have net subsidies for roadways. A little bit in Germany, 30% about in the United States. And then you start, you see, see it shifting in Germany, 1987, and then you go all the way over to 2009. Today, they are collecting about twice as much, or two and a half as much, revenue from road users as they spend on roadways. Versus in the United States, throughout the period, to some varying degree, there were uh, sub net subsidies for roadways. And that's, these are just the internal costs. These are not externalities or anything. It's just really the cost to build and maintain uh, the roadway system. More local policies to restrict car use include traffic calming. This is, again, a map of the city of Freiburg. <coughs> what you see in the salmon color here are the traffic calmed areas. Speed limits are 20 miles per hour 
in those areas. In blue, you see the super traffic calmed areas. We have seven kilometers per hour. That's walking speed, three miles, four miles per hour, really, really slow. In white, you have the car-free pedestrian zone here in the, in the downtown. And in yellow, you have the streets where they try to channel uh, car traffic to. An example for traffic calming that's from Freiburg, the Klara Straße in the 1970s, this was a street for cars, almost the sidewalks were for cars as well, the cars were getting on the sidewalk. Today, this is a traffic calm street, they changed the pavement, they put in uh, pedestrian scale lighting, trees, benches, and bicycle parking. Many of the new neighborhoods they are building now are immediately super traffic calm. This is uh, seven kilometers uh, per hour. They don't even build a sidewalk here because car travel speeds are so slow to share with uh, pedestrians and bicycles. In the city center, Freiburg was the first German city to have a network of car-free streets implemented in 1973. See a couple of photos here. Trolleys are running, are running through there. In order to implement this, because of fears of businesses, what they did is they, that's the car-free zone in here, and the reddest other trolley lines, they built or enhanced a ring road for cars around the car-free zone, and they built the blue areas here car parking, mainly in parking uh, garages. They just expanded the car-free zone over here, and this road was also moved um, further out. Again, the use of the downtown in, uh, in the 1960s, it's a car park. Today, they have a daily market there, an outdoor seating uh, for restaurants. Again, a policy shift in how downtown areas is used. Um, in the U.S., this is also happening in quite a few places. This is probably the most publicized example, that's uh, Broadway in New York City at Herald Square or Times Square. They have now exchanged the street furniture. It's much nicer uh, chairs and tables they have now. That was the trial period. They had quite cheap, cheap things there. Um, we also have some cities that have a history of having pedestrian malls here, like Charlottesville, Virginia, or Boulder, Colorado, even Santa Monica in uh, uh, Los Angeles. This is from Toronto, a pedestrian scramble. We have the normal traffic Sig signalization and pedestrians can go with the cars and there's one special cycle there where pedestrians can also cross diagonally, again giving, this, giving pedestrians more priority on the intersection. Again, New York City, the High Line, an abandoned uh, freight corridor that is very popular with pedestrians. On the weekends it's almost too popular to even uh, go there. It's not just about restricting cars, but it's also about making other modes of transportation more attractive and a viable uh, choice. First of them is public transportation. This shows you public transport trips per inhabitant for various countries. You have the U.S. over here, about 24 public transport trips per person per year. Canada, 55. The Netherlands with 50. Switzerland all the way here with 240. And then Sweden, Germany, and other European countries um, over there. One factor that helps explain higher public transport use in Germany are the so-called regional transit authorities. They were pioneered in Hamburg up here in the 1960s uh, where all transit providers in the region, this, that's bus, light rail, um, your regional rail, etc., they cooperate, they coordinate their timetables, and they coordinate the ticket. So you have one ticket as a passenger and can use all of these modes. So you don't notice when you, when you switch across operators. They also provide steeply discounted monthly tickets and student tickets, and the overall goal is to improve connectivity. And what you see in this map is are all the regional transit authorities in Germany. So every little area here that you see, Berlin, around Berlin, that's quite a big one, is, one, is a, a regional transit authority. Freiburg was one of the front runners in regional transit planning, but mainly in having a, a, a ticketing uh, for the region, a transferable ticketing. In 1984, the city, and that's only the yellow part here, introduced a ticket for all transit in the ticket in the, in the city that was transferable. So you had a monthly ticket, you paid a flat fee once a month, you could use the ticket, but you could give it to someone else. In the evening, you could take one more adult and children on the same ticket, and the same on the weekend. It was very successful. Transit ridership increased considerably, so that in 1991, the adjoining counties, that's the orange and the yellow here, joined Freiburg to have a monthly ticket for the whole area. And I think I would have to look at the percentages. Transit ridership increased about 40, 50 percent from 84 to 91, and then another 70 percent after the regional ticket 
was introduced. They're coordinating 75 towns, 17 different operators, and about 3,000 kilometers of routes. The price is 450 euros, about $600 for the year, to get access to the entire uh, area here. Students, and you may like that, they only pay 70 euros for six months, so 140 euros, $210 for the entire year to get access to that system. They now have a new regional card that also includes membership in car sharing and I think reduced bike parking at the parking garage at the train station. Over time, because of the increase in volume, so the price dropped for transit, but the volume increased so much, the financial efficiency of the transit system in Freiburg increased. Freiburg's not alone. That happened all over Germany. This shows you the share of operating costs of transit paid by Fairbox revenue from 1990 to 2007. Germany is here in, in red, going from 60% to about 77% that's now paid by, uh, uh, by Fairbox revenue. As comparison here, we have the United States going from around 40% to 30% and staying down there. Interestingly, the U.S. is less efficient than formerly communist East Germany was in 1990. What they did in Freiburg was not only the ticketing, but they also started expanding the transit system again. If you have really good eyes, you will be able to see gray lines here. These are the lines they tore out in the 1960s. By 1970, the black lines is the transit system they had left. And then they started expanding, and you see the stages of expansion with the associated uh, years. The system is quite small, only 36 kilometers, maybe 25 miles of trolley, of, of light rail system, but they have been expanding it. They've also upgraded their rolling stock and their vehicles with real-time information at stations, real-time information on vehicles, low floor boarding to lure people into public transportation. It's not just about integrating the tickets, but also integrating the different modes of public transport spatially. This is the main train station in, in Freiburg. That's where the regional rail and the intercity rail stops. The bus station is right here, and literally you can walk to platform one from here. Across, they have a, a light rail, and they have, you have elevators and escalators here. And then here they have a bike parking station for a 1,000 bicycles right next to the train station. This is a photo inside that bike parking station. That's a bike parking station in Münster, Germany, which is even larger, 3,500. This is more typical along regional rail stops. Um, you can lock your bike, and it is uh, covered. We also have that here in the United States and in Canada, two union stations, Toronto and Washington, D.C., bike parking for around 130 bicycles at each station. And, of course, many U.S. transit systems have upgraded their vehicles as well. It's the Hiawatha Line in Minneapolis, that's San Francisco, that's the Hudson-Bergen Light Rail in, in New Jersey, that's Toronto. This is a refurbished PCC car running in uh, uh, Philadelphia. Here also we have real-time information in uh, Toronto. The next uh, mode of transportation I'd like to discuss is bicycling and promoting bicycling. And German cities have been quite successful in increasing the share of bicycle trips over the last 30 years. This shows you various cities between the mid-1970s and the 2000s, and we see that cities on small levels like Stuttgart, they went from 2 to 6 percent, Berlin going from 5 to over 10 percent now, even wealthy cities such as Munich going from 6 to 13 percent. And then the bicycle-friendly cities like Freiburg and Münster are starting at a high level but continuing to increase uh, the bike share. There has been some federal involvement in that, but very limited. There's only a national bicycle plan since the early 2000s. However, there was flexible funding from the federal government where local governments could decide if they use it for cycling, for walking, for transit, or for the car. And the federal government built bike paths along federal uh, roadways. This is the bike network in the city of Freiburg. You see these are the separate bike paths they have. It's the city, but it also extends way into the hinterland. So you can cycle into the city without cycling in traffic with cars to reach their downtown, not just within the city, but all throughout. Bike trips increased from 70,000 in 1976 to 210,000 um, today. That's almost one bike trip per person per day in the city. The bike facilities they have are very similar to what you have here. They have uh, bike lanes, they have sort of cycle tracks on, on the sidewalk, they have bike boxes here without you have them with the green color. This is a bicycle street where cars can also enter but sort of at the mercy of the, of the bicyclist. Many German cities have these 
separate bike paths, sort of as the, the backbone of their bicycle network. In fact, Freiburg is now building sort of bicycle highways that are going through the city with the goal to make bicycling faster than going by automobile. But that's in the, in the future. Many suburbs are connected with bike facilities. So if you have high, high speed, high car volume roads, they're building in some distance uh, bike facilities to accommodate cycling in suburban areas. Most school children in Germany, as in the Netherlands and Denmark, have bicycle training in school in third or fourth grade. The police come to the classroom, they teach the children first in the classroom about cycling and how it works and how the traffic si signs work. Then they take them out on a little mini parkour. This is a fancy one in, in Berlin. We have little traffic signs. And the kids have to cycle around and the police will call on you if you make a mistake. And you can pass a test. Uh, when I passed the test, I was very proud that I passed the test. And you can also bring your own bicycle and your bike can also pass the test if it has brakes and lights and everything. And nowadays, the police also take the children outside to cycle with them in real traffic. That's a change. They didn't do that when I, when I was younger. It helps the children to cycle and it helps to put the parents at ease that the children actually know what they're doing when they are cycling. Training motorists is the other part of the equation, and this is from the German driver's test. There's a written test and an on-road test. That's from the written test, and for all of these, you have to answer the question, what, what should you do? I only chose questions where you have to yield to pedestrians or bicycles, but there are also others. It's not, it's not, a, not a giveaway that you always have to say, oh, I yield. Um, an interesting part of the law is this here. If there are children present, you as a driver have to be especially careful not to hit them. So here you see these two kids sort of, sort of dressed in 1980s, so it's an older photo, but they're saying goodbye. And so you as a driver have to get ready to brake because the child may cycle into the street without thinking of it. So you have to be extra careful even though the children may be doing something that is unexpected. And by the way, I failed my driver's test because of that. So I didn't, I didn't hit a child, but <laughs> I was driving and I thought everything went fine, but what they, they said is I wasn't observant enough I didn't look over my shoulder enough to watch out for pedestrians or cyclists. I mean, we drove uh, by parked cars in neighborhoods. I wasn't ready to brake if somebody could run out of that. So I had to retake the test, which was very uh, embarrassing. And it's very expensive, by the way. Driver's license runs around $2,000, $2,500 $2, in Germany. This is putting it all together. That's the city of, of Berlin. Um, three and a half million inhabitants. What you see here is their bike network. They provide bike lanes and paths mainly along higher level roads. And then they have traffic comp most of their neighborhood streets and have increased their bike share. These are share of bike trips. These are many of their bike facilities. They have bike lanes. They have sort of cycle tracks. They have super traffic comp. That's a nice sign. It's walk, walking speed. You don't have to read, read German to understand that. <laughs> Here in the US, many cities have also followed that trend in building bike paths and lanes. There's Portland over there with a big increase in uh, the length of bike paths and lanes per 100,000 population, sort of followed by Minneapolis, and they have Washington, D.C., Montreal, and other cities um, there. Cities like New York are experimenting with cycle tracks. I think New York is important because of all the media attention it's get, it gets. So if cycling things can work in New York, many other cities will see it more, more, more readily than, uh, than from elsewhere. But also other cities. I don't have, have pictures from, from Portland here, so just to tease you, there are photos from Minneapolis. Um, but also photos from Ottawa. These are separate these are off street uh, paths. That's the Stone Art Bridge in Minneapolis, a former railroad bridge that was converted for pedestrians and bicycles. The most visible bike lane or cycle track, or however you will call it, in the US is probably on Pennsylvania Avenue. If you watch the inauguration, you could see President Obama walking alongside Pennsylvania Avenue, and you could see the bike lanes. Don't know if you noticed. So the, it was a presidential inauguration with bike lanes uh, on it. For the next president, I would wish he or she would cycle from the Capitol to the White House. But we'll see if, that, if that's going to if that's gonna happen. By the way, I don't really like the design they have there in the center of the street. It's a little awkward if you, make, if you turn, turn off it, but we can discuss that uh, probably later. This shows you the increase in cycling in D.C. for the commute from 2000 to 2007. The darker the red color, the higher the share of bike commuters. And in blue and brown, here's the blue, there's some brown, you have their bike network. And you see that there's a correlation, a spatial correlation, between where the highest levels of increases in cycling are and where the bike infrastructure was built. Some bike lanes from New York City, of course, enforcing bike lanes. 
is important. The experience that yesterday in Eugene when we were cycling, there was a big truck parked on the cycle track on, on Alder Street. We had to, to get around. Bike sharing is uh, very popular in Western Europe and in the U.S. This is Capital Bike Share. That's nice ride. In Minneapolis, that's in, uh, in Boston. So more and more cities have these bike sharing systems. And our analysis of data for cabby in D.C. shows that many of the cabby users say they don't have their own bicycle. So it's sort of a group that either gives up their bikes or that doesn't have a bike and gets attracted to cabby. There's also bike training, of course, in the U.S. Not mandatory, though. It's typically on a voluntary basis. The last group of policies I want to discuss is the integration of transport and land use planning. Because if you can't keep densities high enough or trip distances short enough to make public transport, walking, and cycling feasible, uh, you're in trouble. In Freiburg, over the last 40 years, the transport and land use plans have become more and more aligned. If you look at the documents in the 70s, there were still two, two separate documents. 80s, they're a little bit more closely aligned. Today, they sort of have complementary goals. In the land use plan, one of the goals is to create a city of short distances, which is about accessibility. So in neighborhoods, having access to supermarkets, pharmacies, and everything for your daily needs. They don't talk about the mode of transport, how you get there, but they say that you should have access in a short proximity. The transport plan, on the other hand, has the goals of minimizing car travel, shifting car trips to other modes, and mitigating the harmful impacts of cars. This is very strong language, and if you look over time, they shifted their language. In the beginning, it was more about, oh, building alternatives to the car, but also having car travel, and the alternatives got stronger and stronger, and now the language for reducing car use also got stronger and stronger, but only over time. This shows you how the land use is clustered around the light rail system they have in, in Freiburg, and about 80% of all residents live within half a kilometer of the light rail system, and I think 70% of them also work within a half a kilometer of the light rail system. So it's a feasible mode of transport for many trips in the city. The two brownfields of Rieselfeld and Vauban are good examples of how they are redeveloping now around transit and also around walking uh, and cycling. Rieselfeld was a sewage farm out here. Vauban was a former military barracks in the in the city center here. Both of them were built around the extension of the light rail. And these are a couple of photos. In both of them, the light rail is at the center of the new development. They have relatively small automobile streets on the main street. In Rieselfeld, you even have to go around to enter the neighborhood by car. The main entrance is only for bicycles, uh, pedestrians, and the, the, the light rail. Most of the neighborhood streets are traffic calmed. A big part of them are super traffic calmed. But cars have to be really slow and where the space is shared with playing, playing children and bicyclists and pedestrians. Vauban is very interesting because they sort of promote car-free living. So in that neighborhood, you cannot park your car permanently. That's a photo from Vauban. You can drive in there, you can drop things off, but if you want to park your car, you have to park it in a parking garage at the edge of the neighborhood. And if you buy property in that neighborhood, you can buy a house without car parking, and if you want to park your car, you pay extra to get a parking spot in that, sort of taking the cost for parking out of the price uh, for housing. But it's only in Vauban, not in, uh, in Rieselfeld. There are great examples in the United States as well. Portland is one of them included. One of them is very close to where I work, which is the Roslyn Boston Corridor in uh, Arlington, Virginia. What they did with planning starting in the uh, 60s and 70s they took a new metro extension that was built, took it from the initial alignment in the median of an interstate, put it underground their main street, and designed what they called the bull's eye concept around the station. Today we would call it transit-oriented development. They didn't have the term then, but this higher density, mixed use right around the stations, while preserving lower densities in the neighborhoods outside of these bullseyes. And it's been very, very successful in a changing travel behavior, but also in promoting density and mixed use around that. That's a, a shot of Arlington County, and that's the Roslyn Boston corridor. Here you have the metro stops, you have the density here, and then the density ends sort of where the bull's eye, eyes end, and you have lower density. And there's Washington, D.C. in the background there. And this is Arlington County in the 1970s, sort of an inner suburb, lower density, commercial districts that are ailing because 
uh, things have moved on even further out. What do I think are some lessons we can discuss or we can take from this? First, I think policies have to be multimodal. They have to include incentives for walking, cycling, and public transportation. At the same time, they have to include disincentives for driving. And likely implementing the policies together is, is the best because if other modes get more attractive and are viable alternatives, you'll more likely agree to have policies that restrict car parking, restrict car travel speeds, etc. So these policies have to go together. Many U.S. cities already work on these policy carrots to promote other modes. But my feeling is that reducing the attractiveness of the car is not done as much here in the United States. So that's traffic calming of residential neighborhoods, the entire neighborhoods, not just certain streets, car-free zones in downtown, taking out car parking in city centers, etc. Support from higher levels of government is important, mainly in the sense of having access to or having flexible funding coming from higher levels of government that you then on the local level can use as you want. So not having the money come with strings attached, you have to use it for roadways and you can't use it uh, for anything else. Um, controversial policies tend to be implemented in stages. Like in Freiburg, they started traffic calming in neighborhoods they complained most and then expanded it from there or the the gas tax increase with the environmental tax reform we talked about, it was sort of every January 1st the gas price went up. It was not all done at once. It was in stages. We see that a little bit in New York City where they had the pedestrianization of parts of, of Times Square as a trial project first, and then they studied it, and then they made it, um, they made it permanent. The sad news is, or the thing about patience is, Policies must be long-term for lasting impact. You will not change travel behavior from today to tomorrow. What I showed you here was a process over 40 years that transformed the city. So changing transport systems, changing land use, and changing behavior of people will not happen quickly. It will take time. And as the backbone of it all, try to integrate the transport and land use planning to keep the densities high enough for public transportation and the trip distances short enough for uh, walking and cycling. And now I thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. I'm right at 45 minutes, so that's, that's good. Thank you. Right, thanks. thanks, Rob. Oh. Great. Great. Um, I noticed that in Freiburg, the, uh, the transit mode split looked like it had been relatively constant for quite some time. Um, any thoughts about that? Is that, you know, is, uh, do you foresee transit increasing significantly in Freiburg over time, or do you think it's kind of reached its natural limit? So the, the numbers are a little bit contentious. If you talk with the transit agency there, they will show you trip counts and counts of passengers that have been increasing versus the mode share numbers I showed here are sort of flat. So the transit agency says, well, the travel surveys are not that reliable. We actually have more transit use. What they also say is that they have big fluctuation, which is likely related to the cycling. So on cold days and on rainy days, they have crush loads on transit. On very nice days, they have much lower. And so that's one of the arguments against the travel surveys. Well, if they don't cover certain periods of the year or certain uh, certain rain events or things that they underestimate the transit use. So the transit agency claims that transit is actually higher, but they cannot tell you where the riders came from, if they are from the car, if they are from the bicycle, or if they are from, from walking. So I would say it doesn't, hasn't reached its peak, and their numbers look quite convincing, an increase in ridership, but it doesn't materialize in the, in the travel survey data looking at the, at the mode split. So I think transit is, is increasing. Either all trips are increasing and transit stays flat, or the travel survey indeed does not capture, um, capture it fully as the transit agency suggests. But it's also in their best interest to suggest that they are growing while the data don't show that. Oh. <laughs> So you didn't talk too much about uh, location of bikeways, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the importance of good bicycle facilities on commercial main streets uh, versus parallel 
to commercial main streets and what, what you've seen in cities around the world? I think I've seen, I've seen both. I think more recently I've seen more bike facilities on main, on main streets or along commercial avenues. And there's been research also showing that bicycling has a positive economic impact. I think I've seen more sort of parallel street treatments, but they are maybe a little bit older in many German cities where you sort of had the, you have the main street and you have the bicycle sort of on, on a more residential street, one block or, or two blocks over. But more recently, I think you see more of the, of the bike facilities also along these commercial corridors. I couldn't point to a study. That's just by observation. Maybe someone here in, in the room knows of, of studies that look, look at that. But it's, that's my, my sense is that the trend is towards having them more on, along the commercial streets. So I was glad that you talked a little bit about um, political and policy decisions that were made. Um, and you sort of offhandedly mentioned, you know, neighborhoods that complained. But I'm wondering, here in the U.S., there's so much political redi reticence to implementing these policies. And I think in some places, federally, it's getting a little more restrictive. And I'm wondering sort of how, um, how a lot of these policies came about if there was organized efforts sort of locally, local advocacy organizations that came together to do this, or whether it was something the government kind of pursued on their own and they just had their own sort of cover because of the culture, or just sort of how that momentum built? So in Freiburg, a lot of it came, was a grassroots effort. And in fact, the latest land use plan we discussed here, that was developed with some citizen input, but then when the draft was out for review, there was so much protest against it for not being environmentally friendly enough, they had to throw it out and redid it with about 900 people participating continually to, to develop the, the new plan. The origins of sort of the Freiburg becoming a more environmental city are in the 1960s when the state government tried to place a nuclear power plant close by. And that sort of brought together sort of the leftist students, but also the more conservative farmers. Nobody wanted to have a nuclear power plant right there. And then that was aggravated by the French government trying to build a nuclear power plant right at the border. That's what many countries try to do, to build the power plants close to your neighbor so you don't have to deal with them. But so then that sort of kept this environmental movement going, and that started switching to looking at uh, solar and wind, and then also sustainable transportation came along with that. For example, traffic calming in Germany came about by German planners going to the Netherlands and seeing what are the Dutch doing. And then they brought it back to Germany, dropped many of the nice features, sort of more bare bones, only having a traffic sign and a couple of, of planters in the street. But they imported the idea. And the federal government that's sort of regulating traffic signals and tra uh, traffic signs, they did not want to allow traffic coming first. Because, oh, it's not proven. We cannot do that. And then German cities started implementing that and studied it. And then once it proved to work and successful, the federal government then um, adopted traffic calming and the low speed limits in their official catalog for, for, for traffic signs. So a lot of it was, especially in Freiburg, driven from, from bottom up uh, versus from, from top down. And today the trend is more, and maybe more, I don't know about Oregon, but more in the California way is there, um, in the state of where Freiburg is, there are many more referendums these days, so you, you can call for a referendum, you need a certain number of signatures, and then there will be a state referendum on, on policy. So that's, that's growing. Maybe learning not from California, but from Switzerland, just to the south, and they've been doing that for, for much longer. Uh, you mentioned that Germans drive about half the uh, amount of kilometers or miles than Americans do. And um, that brings up a lot of questions for me about uh, what are the, um, the commuting distances um, and differences between the U.S. and in Germany. And also, is, um, do people live closer to their work, um, where they work? And do you think there's a difference or a correlation between home ownership percentages in Germany and the U.S. and how that affects where people live and if they, how far they commute, those mm -hmm. sorts of things? Okay. So first answer is commute distances are shorter, at least if you look at the National Household Travel mm -hmm. Survey and the German uh, equivalent uh, to that. Also distances to doctor's offices, to supermarkets, they are all, it's self-reported data, but they are all uh, shorter. 
Um, one reason behind that is, I think, related to zoning. So in the U.S., when you compare everything else equally, when you compare U.S. zoning practice to German zoning practice, you have larger zones in the U.S. The German zone is often as small as a block. So even if you have single-use zoning in Germany, if a zoning is for every block, you, in fact, get sort of mixed-use zoning because the next block is, is zoned differently. You have larger zones here in the U.S. And then if you look into the zoning codes, and my colleague Sonia heard the wonderful research on that. If you look at what is, even if you have single-use residential in Germany, the things that are allowed in there are very different from the U.S. U.S., you can have single-family home. It's a single-family home. In Germany, you can have multi-story buildings, you can have doctor's offices, you can have cafes, and that's all in a residential zone. So the zoning is not as strict, or more things are allowed within a certain zone. And of course, there, there are exceptions, but I think that helps explain the shorter trip distances as well. You have smaller areas that are zoned for, and the zones themselves allow for more, um, for more different, different uses. Um, the home ownership is an interesting question. So Germany is a country with a very low home ownership, home ownership rate, even compared to Europe. Uh, I think I've seen a study by a fairly conservative think tank in D.C. that looked at home ownership rates. And so you have, I think countries like Denmark had very high home ownership rates, maybe even higher than the, than the U.S., but I, I may be mistaken. So, but you have these countries that have a lot of transit uh, walking and cycling that have high ownership rates and you have others that have low home ownership rates. So I think home ownership alone may not, may not explain the, the difference. But you're right, the U.S. has a much higher home ownership rate than Germany has. Um, so there's a question from uh, one of our online viewers from Catherine Hughes. So she was wondering if you can speak a little bit more to scale and historical context since European cities were developed on much smaller scale hundreds of years ago while U.S. cities are more grown in the last century or two, if you can comment on that. Mm -hmm. So scale definitely uh, plays a role and the, the space uh, to spread out. In the case of um, Freiburg, you had the the city center that was sort of destroyed in the Second World War and then was rebuilt in its old way. So they used the old fit footprint. That's why the photos you saw there looked very medieval. It's 60 years old, but it looks very old because they built on the small footprint. Some other German cities decided to adapt more to the car and built more like 1960s ugly, or 1950s ugly, ugly style and uh, allowed more the cars. It, I'm sorry, sorry, if somebody loves the 1960s, I, I, I don't like that style. Um, and allowed the cars uh, in, uh, in a lot more. But, but you're right that U.S. cities are much more um, spread out. One of the reasons for that is also relying in the, in the zoning. So in Germany, within a municipality, um, the developed areas are zoned. The non-developed areas are typically not zoned for development. So you don't have the right to develop there because it's not zoned for development. Development happens in those areas uh, for various reasons. Let's say BMW comes in and says, oh, we generate X dollars of tax revenue. They say, okay, you can develop there. But typically, you have to sort of bargain with the local land use planners to develop somewhere. And typically, the way they develop is they are just adding areas to the existing developed area. So there's spatial expansion is much slower than in the, in the U.S. They're still sprawl, mainly for economic reasons, tax revenue reasons, and, and all these things, but cities are much more compact, and it has to do with, with the zoning and the way zoning is done. Other questions in the classroom? Okay, one last question from, oh, was there one? Okay. Um, so you had mentioned that uh, disincentivizing car use was kind of an essential policy component. And I, it seems like in the U.S. we have a really hard time getting disincentivizing car use, and you know, either through da uh, gas taxes or um, you know, the, the zone in New York City that, that failed to go through. Um, so I wonder if you can speak to places, are there places in the U.S. that have had success in disincentivizing car use, and what are some paths forward there? So for, for specific U.S. examples, I mean, in Germany, there are no, there's no congestion pricing either, and they, they've been trying to put uh, tolls on highways, for example, which is so, sort of common here. You pay a toll when you go over a bridge or when you're on, mainly in, uh, also on the East Coast, when you're on a, 
on a highway, you, you pay a toll. There are no tolls in Germany. They're tolling trucks. Everybody could agree that too many trucks from other countries are going through the country. Let, let's toll them. But <laughs> citizens don't, don't really agree to, to pay tolls for using, for using the highway. So there are certain things that are feasible here, like tolling or having toll facilities uh, that are not feasible there. But then other things, like the gas tax, does not really seem uh, feasible here. So I think restricting car use can be done through things like, like tolling. Very often, though, it's, it's used in the way to still promote car use. Like in, in Virginia, they, now on the Capitol Beltway, they added lanes. So the state sort of ran out of money to build more roads, but they can get private people to build roadways, and then they allow them to, 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 to charge for it. I think there are cities that have uh, reduced uh, car parking, or they are requiring, they're, they're going away from this practice, which also exists in Germany, to have um, minimum car parking standards sort of trying to experiment with maximum car parking standards. In Alexandria, where I live, which is a very booming area at the moment, we have developers who come in and say, we don't want to build the parking. It's too expensive. The price will go through the roof. But we don't want to do that. So there are some areas that, for Arlington County, they have this um, thing called the Mobility Lab. It's sort of a demand management strategies where they try to incentivize other modes and disincentivize car use. So I think there are some examples, but there are fewer examples of restricting car use than there are in, in, in European cities or European countries. Um, and I think even worse than that is that, as I showed in the one slide, that car use is really subsidized. I mean, if you subsidize something, people will use more than they would if they had to pay the price. And then in Germany, they, they even charge more than the cost of driving, so people use it even less because you're putting an extra, extra burden on it. Um, and interestingly, we saw that in the US with the the oil crisis, over the oil crisis, increasing gasoline price, we saw a much larger drop in driving here than we saw in Europe. There are various reasons. One is that the, the base price here was so low that the fluctuation was huge. I think the gas price tripled. In Europe, it only increased by, by, by about 40%. Uh, but also, I think that because of the subsidization of car driving, that there's a lot of slack in driving. People just drive for many trips that they wouldn't drive if, if the price were higher, so they can they can cut back. Maybe contentious, but we'll see. Over lunch, maybe we can discuss that. Let's thank uh, Dr. Bueller here. Okay. Thank you. So please join us next week for um, a presentation by one of our own, Tara Goddard, um, about uh, our bicycling and walking cool um, attitudes about uh, active travel for adolescents. Thank you.